So, uh, so with all that, I'm just gonna jump right in, assuming that you know this already, <laughs> and uh, assuming you know Ohm's law and um, kind of the sign convention for writing down the equations. And for the activity, I'm going to skip over this example circuit, which I want you to analyze. Again, this is the simplest possible non-trivial circuit. Uh, I guess simplest possible is the one in scare quotes because you know it's not all that simple. Um, <laughs> it's the simplest one that is not trivial to analyze. As in, you cannot simplify this using parallel components or series components. You have to use Kirchhoff's rules. So, um, so I'll leave this for you to do. Um, and good luck. <laughs> I'm gonna do what corresponds to the activity for the second circuit, which is. Um, which is meant to be more complex than the example circuit. And this is the element that, um, that enforces that this has to be more complex than the example circuit because you should have at least the four unique unknown currents. And, and I think, I don't know if it's possible to find the one that has four, it might have to be five. I haven't done the number theory analysis to, anyways, but uh, your circuit should have more branches than the example one does. And I give you some idea for where to look for those uh, inspiration for your circuit. So let me go to um, one of these three places and um, you know get the inspiration. Uh, I think uh, I was looking through this uh, as I was putting together this instruction. I and the just the general chapter questions actually had quite a few. Even even conceptual questions, I haven't really checked that. Um, so this is one example where it's not complex enough because um, because these can be simplified as you know a series and then parallel and then series and then parallel. So um, yeah, okay. So that has nothing complex enough and. Uh, problems. I'm just looking for diagrams, by the way, because it's easier. And, you know, this is you know, an example of a circuit that is way too simple. Um, and I think it's some of these are your homework questions. And I guess I could do these, except, hmm, I mean, I could do that. But, uh, you know, what I think I want to do is, and this circuit actually, um, it says, ask, it asks for these uh, three unknowns. You know, maybe I should do this. I'm kind of debating with myself between these two options, either doing this circuit or doing, uh, doing this circuit with my custom modification. Because really all I need to do to make this circuit not analyzable you, or all I need to do to make this uh, a circuit require Kirchhoff's method is to just insert some batteries here and there. Like I can insert a battery here, insert another battery there. Um, yeah, then I'll be golden because none of these registers will simplify anymore. Um, so I have those, those two options. Um, I guess I'm genuinely undecided, but um, one thing about this circuit that bothers me is it's kind of an overdefined system. Um, it's as though they half digested this problem for you. Um, as in, they tell you the current here and um, and you see the with the current values here that they do satisfy the junction rule at this junction. And that was kind of the only way it could have been. They didn't have to give you this current, for example, and you would conclude that, oh, that's two ampere. Um, so, so this circuit can be a good thing to do. Um, you know, let me do this one. I think what I'm going to do is, so I'm gonna start off with this circuit diagram as the blueprint, but I will, um, 
but I will make my modification. Mainly, I'm going to erase all the register values so that they are just general resistance. And I'm going to erase all the current values so that now I have to find the current as unknown. So, so let me do this circuit. I'm uh, going to make the uh, screen snip. And um, in the software where this is done, let me just uh, erase all the values that I don't want. Uh, I erased all the current values. OK, so this is a, a good kind of structure of the circuit to work with. And uh, I have six unknown currents, so it satisfies the complexity requirement for the second circuit. And um, it's definitely complicated enough that I won't want to solve it by hand. I'll want to, I'll want, I'll set up the equations and I'm going to want to use the computer algebra system to actually solve it. So let me copy this and paste in here. So this is my step number zero in the lab instructions. If you look at the lab instructions, number zero, draw the circuit diagram and uh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> I didn't want to draw it. So I just copied and pasted the one that worked <laughs> and uh, solve the circuit. Okay, so this is where I have to go through the problem solving strategy using Kirchhoff's rules. And um, yeah, so let me go through that. Um, this is the part of the step that can be automated. And this is the reason engineers, engineers get paid a big bucks is you have to set up the system of equations. And that part can only be done by human beings, computers can yet look at this drawing and figure out what <laughs> equations to. So I'm just gonna go through the steps that you will uh, see me introduce in lecture videos uh, at, at more length. Just gonna use that method uh, without too much explanation. So I know I have uh, six unknowns. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I, I know I need uh, six equations. And the way to get those six equations is through Kirchhoff's rules. And I have a very particular order in which I do it. I do it by first using up all the junction rules. So I look at all the junctions. I have one, two, three, four junctions. And I'm going to make sure that I, use, I leave one junction unused. It's because um, you can kind of think through this and see uh, the last junction is guaranteed to give you a dependent equation, equation that depends on the previous three that you already wrote down. So, so you don't want to use that last junction because it's not going to give you anything useful. If anything, it'll lead you into a system of dependent equation which you want to avoid. So I have three equations so far which means I need three more equations to have uh, enough information to solve this system. So this is where I have to use the loop rule. So I'm going to uh, draw all the loops I'm gonna be using. So, um, and I, I have a kind of uh, criteria I use, which is I try to choose the small, um, smallest possible loops that overlap as little as possible with other loops. So the first two loop I define might be this one. Um, and I need to kind of specify direction of the path. So this is the first path I'm gonna use. Let me label it four for the equation I'm going to number after it. And I guess I need another loop. Um, if it goes around this way, it'll, so it'll overlap in some parts that can be avoided. It, you know, they, they are both overlapping in this branch. That's gonna happen but um, it has these other parts that don't overlap with any other loop. And my sixth loop, and I have a number of choices here really, but I'm going to just choose the one that covers the smallest uh, kind of visible area, you know, which doesn't have to be your criteria. And it's actually perfectly fine to choose a loop, let's say that goes around the outside. Uh, it will overlap with these two other loops, but it has this part that doesn't overlap, so it'll work out fine. Um, so that's going to be my loop number six. So these are just uh, my way of organizing the information so that as I write down my equations, one, two, 
three, four, five, six. I can associate that equation with either the junction rule or the loop rule it's coming from. So let me do that. Equation number one is gonna be uh, this junction rule. So I have current I2 flowing in, current I6 flowing in, current I1 going out. So it's gonna be I2 plus I6 current in is equal to current out I1. Oh, I actually probably should start doing that. That um, makes it more confusing, makes it look like a two. <laughs> Sans serif, okay. Number two, uh, so that's this junction. So I have current um, I4, wow, that label is so far. Current I4 and I3 coming in, current I2 going out. And this uh, description of current in and out, that's based on the labels. So it might um, turn out at the end of the analysis that you get a negative number for some of these currents. If you do, that's an indication that the actual current flows the other way. Um, you can kind of see it here, this current I6, it could have flow one of the two ways. I guess this is a plausible direction, but um, I, wait, is, well, maybe the other way isn't all that plausible. I don't know. But uh, what I'm going by is the direction that is labeled in the diagram that enforces consistency. So junction number three gives me my third equation. So current, current I5 going in and current I4 and I6 going out. So I5 is equal to I4 plus I6. Equation number four. Uh, oh, that's, so I'm starting with the loop rules here. So let me start at this point here. And as I go across the battery from the negative to positive terminal, I plus V2 as a voltage change. As I go across the register in the same direction as the current, I have a voltage drop minus in the magnitude of resistance times current. That's Ohm's law. R2 times I2. And as I go across the R4 register, I'm going in the opposite direction as the current. So it's gonna be plus um, R4, I6. Okay, I'm gonna have to remember that these numbers don't always match. Uh, and I'm back to the original starting point. So that adds up to zero. That's the first loop rule. I need two more of those with loop number five. Um, so I'm gonna start from here. So I have the same, rise in voltage and I guess rise in voltage again because I'm going against the current plus R3 I3 and then it's voltage drop because I'm going with the current R5 I5 is equal to zero. All right, very last equation here. Um, I'm going across the so uh, let me start from here. So I'm going across the battery plus V1 and then voltage drop minus R1 I1 and then another voltage drop uh, minus R3 I3 and then another voltage drop minus R2 I2. Either those currents are gonna be small or the V1 has to be large. Okay, so that's my system of six equations. And uh, without the computer algebra system, uh, we'll uh, be trying to solve this for the unknowns, I, one, two, three, four, five, six by hand. And that'll just take me 20 minutes longer if I'm talking. So <laughs> instead of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use computer algebra system. That's going to simplify this quite a bit. So um, this is solve function is what I'm gonna use. I feel like six equation is small enough number that I don't wanna build up the coefficient matrix and do all that extra work. I just want to use it. And what I'm looking for, okay, that's basically the example I'm gonna follow. So I need to define all my variables. Um, so in this other window here, let me define all my variables. Uh, well, do I, 
well, let me try to do it from memory first, and then I'll fill in the missing things. So V1, V2, I have two batteries. Oh. And um, I have, I think, four registers are one, two, three, four, no, five. I have five registers. So uh, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. And I have six currents. That's what I'm solving for. I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6. OK, that's going to be equal a variable. And uh, let me just try to copy and paste. I think on this uh, terminal, if I right click, it copies. And if I right click again, it pastes. Super confusing thing. Um, all right, I think I'm done. Uh, so declare the variables. Now I can do solve. Yeah. Um, and the first argument is going to be this list of um, equations that I need to type in one by one. And then the variables are going to be the six current. So am I? Oh doesn't obscure everything. All right, that seems good enough. OK, so it's going to be i2 plus i6 is equal to i1, i3 plus. OK, um, let me finish writing down the equation. And I see a question in the chat that I'll address. i4 equal to i2. i5 is equal to i4 plus i6. v2 minus r2. Uh, oh, I have to remember, Sage doesn't have implied the multiplication. I have to actually type in the multiplication symbol. And V2 plus R3 times I3 minus R5 times I, I5 is equal to 0. And then the last equation, V1 minus R1 times I1 minus R3 times I3 minus R2 times I2 is equal to 0. Um, yeah, that's three, uh, six equations. I want CH math to solve for the six unknowns, the six current. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So when I press enter, it'll solve. So let me address the question, which is uh, what I mean by going against or with the current. It has to do with the set, two senses of movement. So as you draw this circuit diagram, you see two different kinds of arrows. There are the arrows you drew for the current, and there are the arrows that I drew for the path. Those two are independent. The, the path you draw for the loop doesn't necessarily have to match with the current. Here I try to match where I can, but they don't have to. Now, you, this direction, which went clockwise, it could have gone counterclockwise. So this is what I'm checking for. As I'm moving along this path, I'm looking to see, am I going in the same direction as the current, which I am here with the I4, not that it matters with the batteries. Here, I'm going with the current. The path is going from right to left, and the current I2 is also going right to left. That's what I'm referring to as with the current. And here, this portion of the path is where, so I'm following this loop and I'm moving down here. But if you imagine this current just following its path, the current I6 is moving up here. So the path I'm following is going against the current. And that's where you get this sign here, R4 uh, plus R4 I6. And I think I explained this more at length in the lecture. You have to imagine, okay, if the current is flowing this way, which side of the register is at higher voltage. And you should have figured out it's this side that's at higher voltage. So as you are following the loop, if you're coming from here to here, then that represents voltage rise. So, OK, so uh, let me press Enter here and get an answer of a sort, I hope. I don't know. Sage math on my computer somehow takes a while. I, I think there's some kind of uh, yeah initialization and whatever overhead thing. Yep. Um, 
<laughs> so that's going to be that. Um, let me put that into a uh, variable. So, so that, you know, I don't have to do this over and over. I think, uh, all right, so I think uh, this is how I need to address it, yeah. So this is my I1 and this is my I2, I3, I4, I5, and I6. That's my solution. <laughs> and um, what you clearly see on the screen is why I don't want to have done this by hand. Because it's going to take forever just writing those down. Um, now, one thing I don't quite know how to do with the sage math that's going to hurt me is I don't know how to substitute in values. I know how to do that in Mathematica. You know, I have a list of substitution thing, but again, I don't use uh, uh, sage math enough to know that. <laughs> Let me see if I can get some help with the documentation. Okay, uh, help. Would you call it substitute? Yeah, so let me try this. Um, I'm going to um, put one of those solutions into uh, its own variable because that will allow me to access the uh, tab completion menu. So let's see here. If any of this makes sense, coefficient core. And if I can say something that makes immediate sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google search, uh, which I probably should have done before this session. <laughs> Not integrating anything. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to. Yeah, I, I don't see anything here that's going to be um, what I hope will be substituting in uh, numerical values in place of uh, symbolic expressions. And I'm not, oh, substitute. Maybe that's what it is. Help. Um. Substitute. Uh huh. I think. Oh wait. With the Q works only with the symbols. Um, well, let me just try one thing um, and see if I want XP subs. Um, let's say I want to. Oh, I first want to know what I one looks like now. And if I substitute in um, R3 equals one. Let's see, where did R3 go? <laughs> I'm trying to match these expressions. That, okay, I see an R1 plus one there and that's R1. Okay, so I think I can do it that way. Let's see here. Um, let me just do this here. Um, F is equal to var x and y is equal to var. So I just I want this a second window for looking up. Um, okay. Um, F is equal to x. Okay. Um, well, so I want to, let's see. Dictionary argument is probably what I want. That's the one that, uh, um, that I'm most uh, familiar with in mathematical setting. So something like this, IXP subs, and then dictionary argument. I want to substitute in, let's say, 
Um, so I want to plug in uh, values of the resistances. So R1, let's make it a 10 ohm. Uh, R2, let's make it 20 ohm. R3, let's make it 30 ohm. <laughs> R4, let's make it 40 ohm. R5, let's make it 50 ohm. I'm not trying to be creative here. And um, so that should give me something that's mostly numerical, except for the voltages one and two. Okay, yeah, I think we are golden here. So I can now plug in, okay, V1, let's make it 10 volts. V2, let's make it 20 volts. Okay, great. So this is what I can do. Uh, let me define, um, I don't wanna call it the uh, rule. That's my usual naming convention for something like this. So this is my substitution rule which I'm going to use to plug in values into my algebraic expression that Sage Math has for me. So, and what I can do is with a solution with current one, I can do subs rule that, um, and I guess technically I want that to be numerical thing. I don't wanna work out the fraction. But, um, <laughs> I mean, it's very, oh, oh, I see. I think it's a complaining that um, I1 is, um, you know, that's a symbol. So uh, let me, there's gotta be a, something to turn um, fractions into uh, decimal representation maybe. I don't know. I, you know, I think this is not worth the time. I can always just do the number calculation on a calculator. So, or I, I can, yeah, so, so let me do this. <laughs> so we do those uh, substitution values. Uh, these are the currents that my theoretical analysis is predicting. These are the currents I1 through I6. So, you see a couple of things that I was saying happen. Two of my currents are negative, which means the actual direction of current is opposite to the direction that was labeled. So I3, which was labeled to go this way, apparently it's going left to right. And I6, which was labeled to go this way, apparently it's going the other way. And I think the reason that is, is um, I put in the values where the, the, this battery is, has more voltage. So uh, this is the main driving thing. I think that's why. Uh, if I somehow swap to these two values, then it'll probably be the other way. But okay, so this is the um, kind of theoretical analysis that you can do. And, um, and so you, you saw the, um, the analytical expression and you saw what the uh, predicted values are if you plug in these particular values as the component values. And I want you to uh, have these numbers so that I can actually now check this prediction with, uh, with a simulation. And you know, simulation is technically just another form of um, theoretical analysis. So it's not really adding any new information, but what is this useful for is it, um, it, well, it's useful for something. Uh, let me find a better articulable reason later. <laughs> it is useful for something. <laughs> I, it, uh, it's useful in circumstances where sometimes all this algebra gets in the way of conceptual understanding. Simulation gives you something you can visualize and um, some of the things that may not make, oh, wait, I already had it. Um, some of the things, you know, if, it has its uses. So what I need to do here first is I need to build a circuit and I need to build a circuit with the, um, the, the places where I can measure the, uh, the current in mind. So let me first focus on building the circuit. By the way, I think this is less confusing for me. So I'm gonna just build a circuit with a, you know, circuit diagram elements that, um, realistic looking images of 
things that are not actually all that realistic. Uh, do I have another register? No, no other register down there. Um, I need Okay, I think that's all the elements. Let me set the values of them first. Um, oh, so let's show values. So V1, I set that to be 10. V2, and uh, I would say, you know, before you set these uh, numerical values, first to check out the simulation so that you have an idea of what range of values are accepted in the simulation. Because you don't want to set, um, like I would have made that mistake with the resistance, except, you know, last, uh, virtual class session, I realized that the simulation only gives me these very unrealistic resistances. So, so I'm going with unrealistic resistances in the values I choose there. 10 ohm, I would never build a circuit with that. Um, so that's R2, uh, that should be 20. Uh, this is R3, that should be 30. Um, R4 should be 40. And R5 should be 50. Um, all right, that's all set. I wonder if with the ammeters, do they have polarity? Yeah, I don't see polarity. <sighs> Well, let me try to see if uh, they, um, if they can indicate a negative or a positive current. So I'm just gonna assume that when it's connected this way, left to right is the positive direction. So, um, so to measure I1, I need to attach this here. That's the current through R1. To measure I2, I need to attach it here and I don't know if this will actually matter in the simulation, but let me flip it around this way so that in case that orientation matters, um, it's uh, oriented in a way to uh, match with the direction of the current here. And same thing with I3. In case the direction matters, I'm gonna flip it around. Again, I don't know if they do. And, um, and I4, oh, that's the current through the battery. So if it's that way, then it would be disorientation. Again, I don't know if that matters. Um, and I5 is the current through this register. So uh, all my numbers are gonna be upside down. Um, not much to know about that right now. Um, I6 is current through that. And yeah, I think this direction will. All right, so now I just need to connect everything. And when I build the circuits, I like to focus on the junctions because you know, circuit is a topological object. So as long as I can smoothly transform it, it doesn't matter. So I want to get this junction right, which connects R3, R2, and the battery. So make sure they are connected the way they are supposed to be at this junction. Okay. And then I want to get this junction right, which connects R2, V1, and R4. So connect to this. And I'm gonna not uh, attach any extraneous wires. So this V1, it needs to go to R2. So I'm just gonna connect it by one straight wire. Not gonna worry about the shape. And R1 needs to go to this junction. And um, okay, I might want some. Yeah, so for that junction, I want a wire to connect R1 to that point. And uh, R5 will have to connect to the junction too. So let me do that here. And finally, this junction here is gonna be V2, R5 and R4. So. Let me connect to this and then connect to this wire. So this is the simulation of the um, current. And okay, looking at the numbers here, I'm pretty sure it's not sensitive. Uh, the numbers you see are not sensitive of the, um, the sign. So, you know, let me do this. Uh, it's especially if it's not sensitive about the, uh, 
the sign, then it's super annoying that I have to read the numbers upside down. So let me just fix that. I probably should have checked for that before committing and building the circuit. Yeah. So, okay. It, it doesn't indicate any kind. So, you know, the sign, I'll have to uh, double check it, it by looking at the currents that are flowing. And I have to watch out that uh, basically what is visualized in this simulation is going to be the opposite direction of an eye because this is visualizing the, oh, oh wait, I can do this conventional. <laughs> that way it's not confusing me with the unnecessary, unnecessary negatives. Um, let me just flip this around so I don't have to learn a new skill of reading the numbers upside down. Um, I think that's enough. The vertical ones, there's nothing you can do about. Okay, so let's see. Um, this was my simulation prediction for I1. It was, uh, so I can kind of do this in my head. That's, you know, divide by 101. That's close enough to divide by 100. So I'll just do that. So I1 should be 0 0.26 uh, plus. So in the same direction as that, 0.26, that's what the simulation shows. I2 should be 0.51 or, I don't know, depending on how you round it. 0.50, that sounds right. Yeah, I3. So it's a negative, so it should be flowing left to right. And 0.09, something like that. Yeah, 0.09 there, flowing left to right. Good. And I4 is a 60. So, or, you know, divide by, I don't know, let me try. Um, 60 divided by 101. Yeah, that's 0.59 when you round it. So. It's 0.59, uh, flowing in the same direction as here. And I5 is this current, so something like 0.35 here. And I6, negative, so here it's flowing left to right, left to right, excuse me, and it should be like 0.25. Yeah, so simulation confirms my theoretical analysis here. And you know, there's an element of uh, duplication here because uh, this is the simulation is also entirely theoretical. Except uh, this is a numerical simulation, whereas this was an analytical anal <laughs> analytical analysis. It's an it was an algebraic calculation where I plugged the, in the numbers at the very end. And so with this, I can do other fun things. I can do things like okay, so. Let's imagine, uh, let, let's, uh, um, let's do this. Uh, do I have time? Yeah, I think I have time. Um, so let me uh, define a different substitution. I said, you know, something about the currents um, I3 and I6, how they would be different if I uh, had the different values of voltages. So let's try it out. So that's my new uh, substituted rules. And I'll just go through one by one. So, that's I1, oops, no, I'm confusing myself. I2, uh, skip to one. Uh, I'll just go in unusual order. Okay, so I, I'm through I4, <laughs> so now I need I5, which is addressed with index four, <laughs> and I need I6, okay. Um, yeah, one of them is, to, it's almost zero going in the wrong direction. Well, I mean, wrong direction. So, all right, uh, let's try that. So it's easy enough to do in the simulation. I just select this and change the value to 20 volts here and change the value to um, 10 volts here. And yeah, this current goes to almost to zero, but still going left to right. And the other, um, what was the, was I3 the previously reversed? Yeah, I3 was previously reversed. Now it's flowing from right to left, the same as the label, the direction. So, so you know, that's the illustration of what I want you to do for the second circuit. Um, so what I just did here is the stem number, uh, wait, second circuit, stem number one. I solved the circuit using computer algebra system. And number two, I checked my solution using the simulation. And, you know, I, it's a, and I'll want to add a narrative, maybe some uh, 
description of why I picked the parameter values, or maybe you spend some time playing with the parameter values, so something that gives you more interesting result. And um, so but all of that is up to you. So, so that's the demonstration of the kind of activity that you would go through to do this uh, DC circuit analysis. And um, I say it explicitly in the instruction here that uh, use of, um, I mean, I tell you about computer algebra system, and I do tell you explicitly that use of computer algebra system is allowed, possibly even encouraged if uh, using this allows you to play around with the parameters like this, because that's something that's just uh, so annoying to do by hand, so I wouldn't <laughs> expect you to do it by hand. So, so, so yeah, use of computer algebra system is allowed, and depending on if you are using it well, <laughs> even maybe even encouraged. Um, what the computer algebra system can't help you bypass is coming up with this system of equations. That's the part that requires human intelligence. That's the part where you have to know how to apply the sign convention. And so that's the part that I, my goal is to train you in, not the tedious algebra. So um, yeah, uh, I see the question, if this lab will be done with your partners, um, I don't see why not. <laughs> if you have a um, if you have a productive collaboration, I think it's good to work with your partner. Just to describe it somewhere in your comments or description that you are working together. So, um, so so that I mean, I think I know who the partners are, but um, you know, you do want to remove all that. As in, um, yeah. So you know, if you are working with someone, just tell me that you worked together. I think, um, yeah. So you can work with your partner. I think is uh, allowed and probably encouraged if uh, <laughs> working well. Yeah, if that's been working well. And you know, I say all this uh, realizing that I have no way to catch people. If one partner is carrying the whole weight and the other partner does nothing, then there's I have no detection mechanism for that. And you know, I would uh, strongly discourage you from abusing the, the structure that way, but um, it, it does help having someone to talk this through like the parameter choices. Here, um, I you know, chose these parameters just on my own, but maybe if I had a partner to talk to, they will think a different value of registers would be more interesting, so. Um, 